So we're going to talk more about it, how we're led by the Holy Spirit. So remember, in John chapter 16, verse 13, it says that the Holy Spirit, when he comes, that he will guide us into all the truth. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all the truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he hears, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He's here right now. If you've not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you know, once we finish this segment, we're going to go into another series about the baptism of the Holy Spirit to really show you in the Word of God that it's an experience subsequent to salvation that is vitally important to your life. We're going to teach it in such a way that you'll see it all over the book so that not only if you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you'll be able to lay hold of that for your life and then teach others. And then we're going to talk about the nine gifts and manifestations of the Holy Ghost. And it'll be wonderful. We'll get a good foundation. We're at the last of the last of the end times. This is a, this, this is a time in the history of man where the church is going to rise up as never before. You have been picked by God to live during this time. You're going to do exploits that are beyond what you've ever even imagined. We're going to see things before the church age ends and we're taken out of here in the rapture. We're right at that point. We need to know how to be led by the Spirit of God. And I want to encourage you, go back and listen to these last four weeks of, of how he leads us. It, it, it just has been, been building. He always leads you right. He's a safe guide. Remember Romans chapter 8. It says in verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are, and we learned in the Greek, the mature sons of God. You want to grow up so that you know how to be led by the Spirit of God because he, he leads every one of us. We have a right and responsibility as the children of God to be led because in your life, you can't see your path, right? We can't see it. The Holy Spirit has to show it to us. There's so many decisions in your life that it, which way do I go? Where do I live? Where do I go to church? Who do I marry? Where do I work? What career do I have? What do I do? What am I to do for him? How do I keep him first and seek first the kingdom while I've got to do all these other things in my life? How do I do it? I'm standing in faith. What do I confess? What do I say? What do I study? I can't, you know, for me, I can't study. I literally can't do it anymore. I can't study what I think about studying. I have to hear from him on what I'm going to study every day boy you go you go so much farther that way you know i'll get into a series on the holy spirit and all of a sudden he'll start talking to me about something else and i could try to study about the holy spirit and it's like walking through wet cement or i could just flow with him and let him flow in these other areas it's good to be led by the spirit of god in verse 16 he tells us, in Romans 8, 16, he tells us how he leads us. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Verse 16, the Spirit himself, it says itself, but it's, it's, the, it's the Greek word for himself. The Spirit himself bears witness with my spirit. He, he leads me by my spirit. He doesn't speak to my mind. He leads me by my spirit. He bears witness with my spirit, man, that I am a child of God. Why does it say that? Because the same way that I know I'm saved, because he's bearing witness with me that I'm saved, that I'm his child, is the same way he will lead me in everything in my life. Actually, throughout all eternity. Because the Holy Spirit's not just going to be with you and in you here. He's going to be in you and with you in eternity. It says he'll abide with us forever. And then we looked at Proverbs 20, 27 that says the spirit of man, your spirit is the lamp of the Lord or it says candle of the Lord. 
searching all the inward parts of the belly. God uses your spirit to enlighten you so that he can guide you. He takes the word of God and the Holy Spirit opens it within your spirit. And that light from the word of God permeates through your spirit, man. We call it revelation knowledge. And it, it goes into your mind and all of a sudden you see something that you didn't see before. Oh, you know, there's a lot of people that can quote a lot of scriptures that haven't seen much of them. And that's why they're not walking in them. Why do you not talk the word all the time? Because you don't see it. Because whatever you see is what you're going to say. Always. So God will guide you through your spirit. So now let's jump over. We started last week. These are foundational scriptures in this series. But now let's jump over to Psalm 37. Because in this psalm, in these verses, it really reveals how the Holy Spirit works. Psalm 37.3. We said this last week. What is that? Trust in the Lord and do good. What is doing good? It's doing the word. Trust in the Lord and do good. If you don't trust God, you're not going to be able to be a doer of the word. Right? You'll be ridden with guilt, shame, and condemnation. You won't think you're worthy. You won't think anything. You'll be beaten up with sin. You'll be living in a way, in a manner that you're not made for. You're just living out of your flesh. God says, no, no, no. Trust in the Lord and do good so shall you dwell in the land. The blessing of God is in the land that he has for you to be in. So geography is huge for a Christian. And a number one attack is the enemy is always trying to pull Christians out of where they're supposed to be. But trust in the Lord and do good, now you're going to be able to dwell in the land. If you're not trusting in the Lord and you're not walking in the word, guess what? you're not going to be able to dwell in the land. What happens is you visit the land sometimes. You might visit the land, but you can't stay there because your flesh is leading you and guiding you all over the place. And then you're wondering why nothing's working. Well, the reason why nothing's working is because you're the only one that's working. Because when we work alone, God calls it nothing. It produces stress, anxiety, you got to realize God has, he loves us so much and he is fullness of joy and he has set up a way where you could take your eyes off all the needs of your life. You could take your, your eyes off all the decisions of your life. You could give it all to him and you could simply focus on knowing him and he will literally direct your path. He'll add everything to you. And while you're sowing into other people's lives, he'll be harvesting into your life. But you can't, you won't see that. You won't have the courage to do that. You'll, you'll just want to control and not let go of things. And God's like, oh, let go of this lower life. Let go of your plan and purpose and embrace my plan and purpose. Let go of your course of action. Embrace my course of action. Because my, Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden's light. You have an addiction in your life? Oh, don't try to overcome it. Let, let who you are in Christ, drive it out of your life. That's the whole thing. So it says here, trust in the Lord and do good, and so shall you dwell in the land. And verily, or most assuredly, you'll be fed. Notice this word fed means pastored or shepherded. Well, who is the great pastor? Who is the great shepherd? Jesus. He's the one that feeds us. You want provision in your life, you got to be in the land. You don't get fed apart from the land. I know. Have you ever lived outside the land? That is no fun. You could be living for God and doing his work and be outside the land. But oh, when you get in the land because you trust him. Sometimes the land is like, I don't know that I really want to be here, but just trust him. He knows you. He knows you after your spirit. See, your spirit, when you get in the land, your spirit is just like, yes. 
Your flesh is like, we got to get out of here because I'm not in control. So sometimes you feel frustrated in the land. Well, let me say this right. Pretty much every time you're going to feel frustrated in the land, in your flesh. So you need to learn how to discern the difference between your flesh and your spirit. Well, guess what does that? The Word of God. Well, guess who shows you the Word so that it can do that for you? The Holy Spirit. Amen? So, there are many Christians, we said this last week, who are trying to use their faith who have not let yet learned how to trust God. God wants you to trust Him. He'll meet you right where you are. You don't have to play games with Him. He sees everything in your life. I wish I had that little squirt bottle right here right now. This if you squirt a squirt bottle and it, and it produces a vapor, and in literally in a couple seconds it just disappears. And that's what our life is like on this earth. Do you realize, see, Satan tries to get you up to here with life. Mark chapter 4, the desire for other things. I got to do this and I got to do this and we got to go here and we got to go there. And God, because he doesn't ever drive you, he doesn't ever press you. That's why at our church, we'll never drive anybody. We never press people. You could come here once a year and we're going to love you when you come. You're going to feel at home, but we're never going to be like, hey, why weren't you in church? No, that's not. See, this is a whosoever will let him come. So what happens is Satan knows this about God. So we tend to let God go down the ladder. Well, I got this going on, and I got that going on, and this going on, and then all of a sudden getting in the Word, being part of a church family, witnessing to others, living for Christ, all of it keeps going lower, and then all of a sudden, where, where you're supposed to be now will feel very uncomfortable. When you read the Word, you'll be like, I don't feel like I'm getting anything out of this. Why isn't God answering my prayer? I, I can't even remember the last time I heard his voice, right? You'll end up leaving a place that's teaching the word and you'll start going here, going someplace where you could feel comfortable. What it is really, your flesh feels comfortable and you're never, you're never prompted to grow, but you're really miserable there. See, in a very short period of time, you and I are going to stand before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It might be very, very short in the rapture of the church, but i got to tell you, my life is going so fast, I'm going to blink and I'm going to be standing before Him. Because my life will be over, and I want to make sure my life on this earth, I am here, I want to bear all my fruit. Now, I can't bear any of it in my own strength or in my own ability, but I could bear all of it in Him. And I, I, I want to stand before him because we're going to stand before him. The judgment seat of Christ is an eternal judgment. No, we're not judged for our sin, right? We're judged for what we did for him. And many are going to stand before the Lord. The minute they step out of their body, they're going to go, man, I live for myself. And, and, and the Bible talks about all the time, don't shrink back when you stand before him. Well, how are you going to stand before him so that you hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with this, and now in my eternal kingdom, you're going to be in charge of this. How, how can you do that? Because you could sit here today and go, well, okay, I need to do this, and I need to do that. Forget that. You need to do one thing. Make him number one and learn how to follow him. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. His a yoke was a rabbi's doctrine. The doctrine of God is easy. Isaiah 119 says, if you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the best that the land can provide. If you seek me first, if you seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, I'll add everything to you. See, we work out only what he's working in. And then it goes into verse 4 delight yourself now he's going to start talking about things once you learn how to trust him once you're being a doer of the word now what's happening is you're dwelling in the land and you're being fed now you're delighting in the lord delight yourself 
Notice, it doesn't say this happens automatically. You have to delight yourself. That word means to be pliable. Only you can choose to be pliable so that God can mold you. It means when you're pliable now, you'll, what happens? How do you know if you're pliable in the hands of God? You know because now it's like, listen, Father, this is not the life that I'm living in the flesh. Uh, I'm living by the faith of the Son of God, so I'll do what you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. I know you know what's best for my life. I know I'm not here to just live an average, ordinary life. I'm here to change the earth in this short season. So now I'm pliable before you. I've humbled myself under your mighty hand. And now that other part of that word means that you make God the source of your joy, pleasure, and satisfaction. God, you, see, if you're not a doer of the word, if you're not if you don't know him, see, to know him is to trust him. If you just are, have warm fuzzies for God but don't really know him. Many, many Christians, many children of God don't really know God. They might know God as their savior. Fire insurance, I'll, I'll spend eternity in heaven. But they don't know God as their healer or their provider. God wants you to, everything he does is so that you can know him in every way. So that you know him as your guide. As you know, you know him as your deliverer as the one that always forgives you, always restores. You know, as I stand before my Lord today, I know that there is nothing that I can do, no mistake I can make to ever affect how great of love he has for me. That whether I'm hitting on all cylinders or whether I'm blowing it, if I ever hit rock bottom, guess who will be the first one that's there? Him. And guess what? If I choose to hit rock bottom, he'll bring me back up and set me back up. I mean, it's amazing. you got to know that about God so that you trust him. Then, because when you're trusting him now, you'll look at the word of God, you'll get over yourself, you'll tell your flesh to shut up, and you'll do the word of God. You'll love people unconditionally. You'll be led by his spirit. You'll go into the fire and not worry because you know he's with you and you, it won't even kindle upon you. This is how we walk with the Lord. And the Bible says we delight also thyself also in the Lord. And then now he is able to give us the desires of our heart. These desires, this, these are the expressions of his will. Most Christians in charismatic word of faith circles have no idea how to be led by the Spirit of God. They're literally playing a game. They're saying, well, God told me to do this and God told me to do that. And they, don't, they wouldn't know the Holy Spirit if he walked in with a neon yellow shirt saying, I'm the Holy Spirit. Why? Because they're living out of these counterfeit desires of their flesh instead of living out of the desires that God has given them. This word desire literally means a longing, a craving, and a yearning for. When God gives you a desire, it's, it's way beyond your flesh. It's, it's something that you long for, that you yearn for, that you crave. I mean, I'm called to be a pastor. I grew up in a church that said, man, don't ever say you don't want to do something for God because he'll make you do it. How many of you, have you ever been there? Don't say you're not willing to go to Africa because, man, you'll be, you'll be in Africa. That's not how it works. So remember those three words. I would encourage you to write them down because this word desire is in the New Testament. It's just masked a little bit. So we're going we're gonna to look at this today. He'll give you the desires of your heart, the longings, the cravings, and the yearnings of your heart. These desires are what we call the inward witness. This is the inward witness. The Holy Spirit, as he gives you those desires, as he reveals the word of God to you, these desires are expressions of God's will. All of a sudden, you see a house, or all of a sudden, you're minding your own business, and all of a sudden, you have this desire for a house. 
And, and, it, and, you know, and you think, oh, you're just being materialistic. No, see, it doesn't work that way for us as Christians. Because why does God want us to live in the house that we live in? To bear fruit. It's always, he wants to, it's the Abrahamic blessing. I'm going to bless you, make your name great, so that you could be a blessing. The Bible doesn't even say he wants us to live in a house. He wants us to have houses. So we could have one, one or two to live in, right? And we could have some to help other people get their start. He wants us blessed so that we can be a blessing. Why, why would he want you to work where you're working? Because there's fruit there. Yeah, but I can't stand anybody I work with. What, what does that have to do with anything? God loves them. Well, I don't want to talk to them. You're not pliable. Does that, does that make sense? Get pliable, and you might never talk to them. You just, but you be willing. You go to work every day. Father, I thank you that you've called me here. Because when you walk in your office or in your factory or wherever you go, wherever you walk, the kingdom of God is there. You could bind the enemy, you could shut him down, and you just live your life. You work not for your boss, you work hard as unto the Lord, but you don't toil. And, you, and God makes you the head and not the tail. And people are watching your life. The Holy Spirit's tapping them on the shoulder going, hey, did you notice? They were just done really wrong and they're still happy. Why? God's using you to bear fruit there. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. See, we said this last week as we closed. God wants you led by the inside. He never wants you to be led by the outside in anything. Don't let things outward lead you. Don't chase money. Don't chase provision. Let it overcome you as you chase God. God doesn't ever want you satisfied outwardly. Because outward thing, outwardly things will never satisfy you the way inward things will satisfy you. And everybody who's walked with the Lord for a while is going, wow, yeah. I've been over here outward, and now I'm over here inward. Oh my gosh, is this much better. You want feelings? When your feelings originate in your spirit, and they're not twisted, those emotions will fuel you to be passionate about what you're called to do in the earth. How do I get from where I am to delighting in the Lord? You gotta hear the word of God to delight in it. Notice I didn't say you gotta listen to the word. A lot of people listen to the word, but they're not hearing it. Hearing only happens when you get revelation of God's word. So you have to hear his word to delight in it. You must meditate in his word. You got to meditate in it in order to hear it. So you have to hear it to delight in it, but you have to meditate in it in order to hear it. So what does meditation mean? It literally means to mutter. The best example is a cow chewing its cud. It eats its food, it swallows it, then it goes, wow, that was really good. Brings it back up in its mouth and chews it some more. Swallows it again, then brings it back up and chews it some more. Now that sounds disgusting, but oh, the word of God tastes so good. And the more you chew it, and it gets down in your spirit, and then it comes back up and you chew it some more. It comes back up in my mouth, and I'm like, wow, Father, you're gracious. You're full of compassion. You're slow to anger, and you're of great mercy. And you're good to all, and your tender mercies are over all your works. Then I, then I, then I, I sit there, and I'm facing something in life, and I just keep chewing. It's like I just keep chewing on the word. And the more I chew on it, the more... It, see, when you, have you ever chewed gum? That's like chewing the things in the world. It loses its flavor. Though God's word, when you chew it, and you know you're chewing it because you're hearing it because it's coming out of your mouth. 
It's like you're blowing a bubble with it all the time, right? When you chew it, it tastes better. And it keeps tasting better and better. And, and the more you chew it, it's not like real food where you get full. Like, think of your favorite dish. What if you had your favorite dish 300 days in a row? You'd probably be like, oh, geez. Now, I don't know, Benny Hanna, I probably might be able to do that, but probably not even 300 times in a row. And that's just, you know, no, I'm teasing. But you know, after a while, your flesh would be like, oh, I don't want that anymore. Filet, get that away from me. But with God, it keeps getting better. Because the more that you taste, the more that you see that he's good. The more you see that he loves you unconditionally. The more that, he, that you see that he sees you as you really are. He doesn't see you in your flesh, he sees you in Christ. And oh, the more you see that he is looking at you with all the belief in the world that you're going to do everything that you're called to do on this earth and you're going to walk out every desire of your heart and you're going to live this satisfying life where you're destroying the enemy, yielding all your fruit, walking in freedom and then all of a sudden you're going to blink and you're going to be standing in front of Jesus and you're going to keep going. That's what this is all about. You must meditate in the word of God. You keep muttering it. Father, I thank you that I can do all things through Christ. I thank you that you make me the head and not the tail. I don't know what to do in life. Father, I thank you. I always know your voice. I am a child of God. I am led by the Spirit of God. Your Spirit, even right now, is bearing witness with my Spirit, my next step. You keep meditating in the Word. Pretty soon you start hearing it. What happens is now the Holy Spirit takes the word and he opens it, the entrance of his word. He opens his word to you and light comes out. And it, see, we study the soul. I was talking about the men, with the men with this on Saturday as we're going through the book of Ephesians. Revelation is when the word is opened and revealed by the Holy Spirit and this light comes out of the word. And it, but see, our spirit and our soul are connected. We, we separate them to study, but they're connected. And what happens is the word goes off in my spirit and it goes into my mind and all of a sudden I can see something that I didn't see before. All of a sudden where I'm sitting here going, I got this many bills and this much money and, I, and, and the deadline's coming when light comes literally you don't even see that anymore and you walk around going wow all of my needs are met according to his riches and glory the money i have it and you're not worried about it anymore that see you're to live in a constant to walk by faith you have to have constant revelation and that's what we're talking about meditation in the word it causes you to understand the word so that you can apply it to your life, so that you can apply it to your life by being a doer of the word. Think of it this way. You've heard me say this if you've been around here. Meditating in God's word will take you from being a hearer of the word to being a doer of the word. Only meditating in it. Not, not getting up going, okay, I'm going to do a better job today. I'm going to walk by faith. Good luck with that. You're going to be really bummed by about 10 o'clock in the morning because it's all in your strength. And Satan, when you mess up for that 30th time, will just get on top of you and say you're worthless. God doesn't love you. He doesn't hear you. There's no chance. And then he'll start pointing to the future. Look at your future. It's been the same for the last 10 years is your future will be no different. And God's over there going, if you would just make a decision to change, Everything will be different. because it's a, And it's not a big adjustment. It's just the change of mind. I'm going to stop walking this way and trying to do it myself. I'm going to walk this way with God and let him do it. That you get that from meditation in the word. And then what's really cool is the word will start producing in your life 
So now you're delighting in the word, believing God for other things, while you're delighting in the word that's producing the results in your life. And what we call this, we're to go from glory to glory to glory. And this is when you sit here and you go, because people will tell you, how in the world? You're always in the right place at the right time. No matter what happens to you, it just seems like it. you always come out okay. And you'll smile and go, oh, I can't take any credit for that. I'm just Tony. That is all God. I'm led by his spirit. And see, here's the other thing that happens. As you go from glory to glory, the Holy Spirit is able to pull out on the outside who you already are on the inside. And you know who you look like on the inside? Jesus. And that's when you become a witness. When all hell's breaking loose in your life, and you're smiling and at peace. You're just like Jesus asleep in that boat. When water's filling this boat, it looks like you're going under. Jesus is asleep because he knows, oh, no, 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 my father told me to go to the other side. And there's not a power in the universe that could keep me from going to the other side. Amen. My father told me, he told me that I've been redeemed from sickness and disease. So this this attack of the enemy, this lying symptom in my body, it can't take me out, number one. And it's got to leave. Because everything has to bow to God's word in me. What a way to live. So now this word desire, see, this is why it's real interesting. There are 14 Hebrew words for desire in the Bible. 14. 14 words in the Hebrew language you could translate desire. Two of them out of the 14 you can translate ask. Only two. One of them is found in Psalm 37.4. So let's look at this again. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you, you could literally translate it, the askings of your heart, the longings, the cravings, the yearnings of your heart. Only one, one of those two words is used only here in Psalm 37, 4. There are 15 Greek words, 15 Greek words for the word desire. Out of 15 Greek words, there's only one that could be translated ask. And this will bring some clarity to some scriptures. So turn in your Bible to the first one. Go to Matthew 18, 19. Matthew 18, 19. This is one of the nine types of prayers outlined in the Word of God. It's called, we use this scripture for the prayer of agreement. It says in Matthew 18, 19, Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask. That's the Greek word. It literally, it's one of the 15 Greek words that are translated desire. So in this is why this, this, this prayer of agreement doesn't work for very many people very much. Because it literally means as touching anything that they shall desire. Anything that they shall yearn for, long for, and crave for. It shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. It's not just the casual asking. No, the prayer of agreement happens when two people touch something. Howard and I, we decide we're going to agree in prayer, and we are delighting in the Lord. See, if you're asking somebody to agree in prayer with you that doesn't have the word first and is not delighting in the Lord, they can't because they won't be able to desire it. They won't be able to yearn. See, if Howard comes to me and says, Pastor, I'd like you to agree with me in prayer on something. I'm going through something. I need an answer. In order for us to be in agreement... We ha he's yearning, longing for, craving this answer. I need to be yearning, longing, and craving this answer for him too in order for us to be in agreement. Do you see why that our law as New Testament believers is we're to love one another 
unconditionally. Because if I'm up to here with myself and I'm not walking in love, I mean, I could care about Howard a little bit, but long and crave and yearn that he gets his answer, I'll be too busy with my own life. Do you see that? You know how many churches, man, church gets out and it's like mice scattering from light. They just out the door. No relationship. Be careful about that. God wants you in people's lives. Ephesians chapter 3 in verse 20 is another example. We're not going to go through all of them, but there's a few big ones that just I feel led to go over today. <laughs> Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could, that, I'm sorry, that you could ask or that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask, all that we desire, all that we long for, that we crave for, that we yearn for. It says here, if we're doing that, or even think according to the power that works in us. See, most of us want the blessing of God, but man, you know, I got a meeting in three minutes and God, you just, can you just heal my body? I got to go. I really don't want to read your word. I just, you know, I, pastor, can you just pray for me? Just lay your hands on me and just pray for me because I got to go. I, I haven't read the Bible. Uh, I, I don't know what the word says, but I just know that I need to be healed. Won't happen. You lay hands on that person, they walk away, they're not in faith, they don't receive anything from God, it's actually worse because now they walk away and Satan goes, see, did you notice? Nothing happened. You need to leave that church, that guy's not anointed. They'll, they'll, that guy's not anointed. Oh, it has nothing to do with the anointing on me. I mean, Jesus, in his own hometown, where they heard of all the multitudes, the miracles that he did, that, well, that God did through him, he was only able to heal a few people of minor ailments because of their unbelief, right? But it's, it's a desiring, it's an asking for, it's a craving. Here's another big one that we use in prayer, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14 and 15. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says this, and this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask, if we crave, if we yearn, and if we desire for anything according to his will, he hears us. Amen. That tells me that if you're not delighting in the Lord so that he can give you the desire of your heart, you're not praying in faith. Do you see why most people are not getting results? This is why you have to be in the Word. I would love to tell you. I'd love to come up here with smoke and lights and play some cool videos and tell you some nice internet stories and make you just go, wow, what a dynamic speaker. And then you walk out and you'd be okay. I'd love for that to happen, but it's not true. God has a life for you his answer to prayer is yes, and so be it unto you. But so many times we're praying too quick. We need to meditate in the word so that we hear the word, and then all of a sudden revelation comes from the word, and all of a sudden you go from, yeah, I, I, I'd, like this, I'd like to be healed, to I, I'm yearning, I'm longing, I'm craving to not have this pain in my back not have this pain in my knee, not have this symptom in my body. I yearn for it. What is that? You are standing up and going, Father, I refuse to take any less than what Jesus provided for me. See, you've got light on it now. And now, right now, whatever, this is the confidence that you have in him. If you ask anything according to his will, he hears you. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask whatever we long and crave and yearn for we know that we have the petitions that we've desired of him you know in the early church the being led by the spirit they would say things like this 
you know, it just seemed right to go this way. Or I tried to go this way, but the Holy Spirit constrained me. So I just kind of went over here. Then we fast forward into the really weak American church. And what happens? We, well, you know, God told me that I need to do this. And, and you know, Alicia's sitting there thinking, okay, that, I'm, I'm thinking it's three scriptures that that violates, but whatever, right? Or a person's not walking in love and not, you know, they got all this secret sin in their life they got, they're because they're not giving it to the Lord. They're living for themselves. They're steeped in pride. They, they, they don't, they're not in church. They, they don't, they're not really doing anything. They're living for themselves, but yet they're walking around going, but God said this and God said this and God, you know, like, like, like God's able to talk to them, but not according to the word. Don't let this be a hard word. Let this be life-giving. Because here's the deal, guys. God is motivated. If you'll just be willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. If you'll put his word first, he'll give you the desires of your heart, and that is your prayer life. That's what you're believing God for. You could, be, you could have sickness and disease in your body, but man, when you see something in the Word, all of a sudden it'll go from you want to be well to I have to be well. And it won't be for you. I have to be well because I got to do this for Him and I got to do this. And oh, Father, I'm so grateful that you made provision for me. We know that we have the petitions. Here's another one. We'll finish with this one. This is a little one. Mark 11 Verse 24. That's good. It's just a little one, isn't it? Mark eleven twenty four. 24, it says this. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire, what things soever you long for, crave the yearning of your heart, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you'll have them. Do you see why this verse isn't working for people? We're praying too quick. Don't, don't feel like you got to pray too quick. You're a child of God. You've been given authority in the name of Jesus. Your enemy is far below your feet. You never wrestle with people. You only wrestle with principalities and powers that have been defeated. And their only thing is they try to talk you into things. So don't, don't be in a rush. Faith is not a rush. Faith is a rest. You go to the car dealership, man, if you don't take advantage of this deal today, I'm out. They're, 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 no, we don't do that. I don't get pushed into anything. I'm led, right? When the desire gets big enough on the inside of you that you cannot help but just pray and ask, you'll have it. If you have to motivate yourself to confess things, you won't have them. If you have to motivate yourself to confess things, you're not delighting in the Lord. Because when you delight in Him, you want everything that's not Him out of your life. Because you want every part of your life to be a witness for Him. All desires come from God as a result, only one way, of delighting in Him. If you don't delight in Him, you will not have any desires from God. And I've been there. It's no fun. You, you, you kind of play church. You're a Christian. You're like that fig tree that Jesus cursed. Oh, it had leaves. It should have had fruit, but there's no fruit. There's just leaves. You just look good on the outside, right? You have a nice third John 2 on your license plate, and you have a nice car, and that means you're a faith man. Nope, doesn't mean that at all. You have a nice little Bible with really fancy leather cover with your name engraved on it. <laughs> doesn't do anything. But the anointing? The anointing is what matters. There's no such thing, this is a big statement, as an evil desire. Notice how the world, TV, they've turned desire. When you think of desire, you think of sexual intimacy, you think of all this stuff, right? Desire, greed, you think of that, but nope. All true desires come from God. There is no evil desire. That's a big one. 
there's, now there's evil counterfeits that look like a desire, but they're not. And here's the cool thing. When you delight in the Lord, a desire from God will grow. And see, if you're like me, I had my own path for my life. So, you know, uh, if I could figure out how to make enough money, I would love to pastor a church about four miles at the most inland from the Pacific Ocean. And, and, you know, that would be heaven to me. And I could just, you know, that would be my office. I could go down there and study the Word every day and it'd just be wonderful. And that was my desire. And then when I learned about these things, that I started delighting in the Lord and the desire to pastor in Omaha, Nebraska has so far eclipsed that that you could not drag me out of this place. Even when it's May and it's 50 some degrees and it's raining. You know, we, we go to Hawaii or we go to California. We're like, you know, when we get back to Omaha, we're like, yeah, we're home. Why is that? Because this desire as I delight in the Lord, it just keeps growing and it'll eclipse any of my own ideas and any of the enemy's counterfeit ideas, it'll eclipse them. Now, if I ever stop delighting in the Lord, what'll happen is those desires will start going back down from God and all these fake ones will just be there in my life and all of a sudden it gets very confusing. If you think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, your life is going to be very confusing because it's going to be all about me. Right? When I was teaching this year the third year pastors, I'm like, don't let it be all about you. Don't be stressed. Because everybody at Rama, you know, your second or third year, what are you going to do when you graduate? Forget all that. Because you could start faking it. You just keep delighting in the Lord. He'll take you where you're supposed to go. In perfect timing. God only puts desires in our heart that are his will for our life. And God always gives you desires that tie in with your purpose, the purpose why you're here. And God only gives you desires that he plans on fulfilling in your life. God never, he doesn't hold the carrot out in front of you. Well, if you do this, then I'll do this. Nope. No. He only, if you have a desire from God, it's in his mind, it's already done. As you delight in him, this desire will increase. So I can identify God's will for my life by these desires. You guys doing okay? We're, we're, we're kind of winding down, but stay with me. You could identify God's will for your life by these desires. Now remember, if, you, if, you're, if God's word is not first place, if you're not meditating in it day and night, if it's not first place in your life, you're not going to hear it, you're not going to see it, and you're not going to have these desires. Don't get bummed out about that. There's no guilt, shame, or condemnation in Christ. Just start the process. You could start it today. And here's the good news. If you've blown it for 50 years, you're still going to get to the finish line. God will redeem the time. Isn't that cool? I love that. I'm being a person who's wasted a couple decades. You know, just a couple. I'm still going to get to the end of my race. How? Have no idea. But I, but I know I'm just going to follow the, just follow like the movie Ants. Just follow the light. It won't zap you, okay? You just follow the light of God's word. Isn't that deep? I had to go to Bible school to learn that. No, I'm just teasing. So... You can identify God's will for your life by these desires. You pursue your desires. You stir up, as you're pursuing your desires, you're stirring up your gifts that God's already placed in you. You flow with the grace of God that's empowering the gifts. And you exercise your faith. These are the four parts of walking out God's purpose for your life. Let me say it again. You pursue your desires. You pursue them. You stir up your gifts. You flow in the grace of God that's empowering it all. And then you exercise your faith. To get things out of your life, to bring things into your life, you use that. That's how you walk out God's purpose. There's not one step in there 
about keeping your eyes on yourself. Your eyes will be on him. And your yearnings and carings and longings will be for others because you already know you're taken care of. You want to walk in healing? Get really serious about, he, about sickness and disease being eradicated from your church family's life. I'm telling you, it just positions you. I have all the grace that I will ever need to use all the faith that I will ever have to see all of the desires that God has given me come to pass. That's the way it works. If I simply pursue those desires, I prepare, I stir up, and use the gifts that God has given me, I will fulfill my destiny. Right? So let's close with this scripture, verse 5 of Psalm 37. It says, Commit your way unto the Lord. And then he says again, trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. What will he bring to pass? The desires of your heart. Notice you don't bring them to pass. Thank God. Why don't you give yourself a vacation and stop stressing about all this stuff that's God's area. Satan will talk to you all day. Well, how's this going to happen? When's it going to happen? This and the how, the when, that's all God. Right? My job is just to be willing and obedient. Commit your way unto the Lord. This is what's tripping everybody up. Putting God first. You know, you can't be led by the Holy Spirit if God's not first. If you don't commit your way to Him... You won't ever walk in the desires of your heart. I'd love to tell you that you would, but you just won't. I've written books on this. I went to that concert. I even bought the t-shirt. We all have. But you can live a victorious life if you choose. The more you commit yourself to God, the more that you will progressively learn how to hear and flow with the inward witness. Knowing the voice of God... Whoever's led by the Spirit of God, these are the mature sons of God. These are people that they've committed themselves to God and now they're progressively learning how to walk being led by the Spirit of God. It's not something that when you make a decision, it's just all there. Nope, it's a progressive thing. God progressively develops His children. He's not in a rush because He says, hey, you're born of God, you've already overcome the world. And this is the victory, your faith. The first step to hearing God's voice is committing your life to Him. That means whatever this word says, that's what I'm doing. I'm going to put Him first. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit will lead you into all of it. Big part of it, you're going to, be, you're going to have to walk in love. Oh, but wait a minute. You have to walk in love. We think that that's us. No, no, no. I said you have to walk in love love the love of god's already been shed abroad in your heart it's already there just walk in it it's not it's not something that i've got to conjure up and figure out no no just walk in the love of god walk by the faith of god right and be led by the spirit of god how do i do that oh you just commit your way to him and trust also in him and he'll bring it to pass Living for yourself will always cause you to miss the leading of the Holy Spirit. Always. This is why God says, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and everything will be added. This is why finances, honoring God in your finances is so important because it gets your eyes off you. It gets treasure in heaven. Once he gives you the desire of your heart, and you commit your way unto him and trust him, he's able to bring it all to pass. Here's a big thing in your life, guys. You'll only be satisfied by things that God brings to pass in your life. You will never be satisfied by things you're bringing to pass in your life. We're, why? The things that we bring to pass can't satisfy us. Oh, it's great. You know, you, you, you just have a great feeling for a moment. 
but I'm talking about satisfy. That means I'm outwardly in peace because I'm inwardly at rest and at peace. Never forget that. The Bible says in Psalm 127, 1, except the Lord build the house, they labor, that means they toil in vain, in vain. This word vain in the Hebrew language means a destructive deception that brings ruin. They labor in vain that build it. What am I saying? With God, He loves you today. As your pastor, I can tell you this from Genesis to Maps. It's, it's so clear in the Word. He's for you. He loves you. His mercy is greater than your disobedience. He sees every weakness that you have, and if you'll give them to him, he'll turn them all into strengths. You can't. I mean, you could get disciplined and you can do some things, but God calls it nothing. There's nothing that satisfies that when you see, I mean, if God, if somebody comes up to you and gives you a pair of socks, you're like, this is so incredible. Why? Not because of the socks. It's because, wow, the God of the universe just led somebody to take care of this little thing in my life everything with God. So today when I leave, he loves you. He is for you. He knows you've been created to be in fellowship and one with him. And he'll supply things to your life, everything you need. The Holy Spirit will lead you into all of it. So today, either just start the process if that's not started in your life. What, how do you start? Lord, I don't really know how to do this because I failed at it a million times, but I'm, I'm choosing today to commit my way to you. I'm, I'm making a choice. I trust in you. And now, Holy Spirit, I've humbled. Boy, I could feel. Be encouraged. Some of you, I could feel what you're feeling right now. It's not too late. God has a plan for your life. You haven't ultimately messed it up. You could still walk it out. Commit your way to him. Trust in him. Listen, he'll be there the whole time doing things in your life that causes you to trust him. And he'll bring it to pass. You'll change your world. Amen?